a way. You make a way when I cannot see. You are my strength. Though my heart is weak, you won't let go. You take my place this morning and you feel like you're separated from God and you feel like you've lost your way and you can't find your way back, God's in this place here and this morning waiting for you with his arms open wide. No matter where you're at in your life, no matter where you've gone, where you've been, God's sitting here waiting for you and he's going to come after you today. Before I 
there's a theologian named Robert Smith Jr. who says that for every New Testament doctrine, there is an Old Testament illustration of that doctrine. And so if the primary doctrine of the New Testament then is that we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, if the primary doctrine of the New Testament is that those who come to Christ, who, those who seek forgiveness for their sins through his shed blood uh, are saved, then there must be many Old Testament illustrations or pictures of that doctrine. And I think one of the most beautiful illustrations of that doctrine is found in Joshua chapter 2. It begins, and I want to read uh, verses 1 and then 17 through 21 to you today, although the whole chapter uh, is worthy of consideration. Uh, Joshua says this, Now uh, Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Achaia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot or prostitute named Rahab and lodged there. Now to verse 17. So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, uh, which you have made us swear, unless when we come to the land you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window uh, through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home. So it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath which we made you swear. Then she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent him away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Amen. This text is very early in the conquest of the promised land. The children of Israel had been in Egypt in captivity for 40 years, or 400 years. They had been in the wilderness for 40 years, and now Moses has died, and Joshua has taken over, and again, this is very early in Joshua's leadership. We're just in chapter 2. And so the task is at hand to now conquer the land that the Lord has given them, which is strange if you think about it because the Lord has said, I will give you this land. It's yours. Now go take it. It's yours, but now go conquer it. And I would say to you and I that there are some things in life that the Lord has given to you and I that won't be ours unless we go and we take it. It's ours. He'll help us. He'll be with us. He'll walk with us. He'll empower us. But we still got to rise up and we've got to take it. And so Joshua is leading the children of Israel into the promised land to conquer the territory. And they come to the place of Jericho this town that they want to take, this walled city. And Joshua sends two spies in to look over the city to, take, to get a lay of the land. It's interesting that Joshua chooses two. Perhaps he remembers that 40 years before, Moses had chosen 12. And of the 12, 10 came back with the report that they could not conquer the promised land. Only he and Caleb came back and said that it was possible with God's help. And so Perhaps Joshua is saying, I'm not going to send 12 so that they can be doubting. I'm just going to find two guys that I know are going to say yes, and I'm going to send them to look over the land and come back and tell everybody we're going to do it. And so he sends these guys into the city of Jericho. The Bible says there that they found lodging in the home of a self-employed woman named Rahab. Now, I don't know how they ended up there. Perhaps she ran a brothel, and part of it was a brothel, and part of it was a hotel. But the Bible says that while they were there, the king and his bodyguards, or the king and his secret police or spies, find out that there are spies in the city, and they go to Rahab's house. They knock on the door and ask her to give up the spies. Now, she must know that they're coming, so she hides them in the roof. And when the spy or when the secret police come, she says, you know what? 
They just left. They got out of the city just before the gates were closed. If you guys will hurry up, you'll be able to find them. You'll be able to catch up with them. They're just a little bit ahead of you. Hurry up and go after them. And then she lets the spies back down. This is what we call in the Bible a holy lie. I don't know how you deal with it theologically, but that's what it is. And uh, so she's talking to the spies, and she says, do you want to know why I spared your life? She said, I spared your life for this reason. She said, I know that your God brought you out of Egypt, and I know that he brought you through the Red Sea. I know that your God allows you to conquer the Ammonites, and I know that your God is going to give you this city. He is more powerful than our gods. Now, just reflect back, if you will, those of you who know the story. Forty years before, as I had mentioned, the spies went into the land, and they said, we can't conquer it. They're too big for us. Now, what they did not know because of unbelief was that the people in the land were afraid of them. But they didn't know that, so they were afraid of the people in the land. God knew that the people in the land were afraid of them. God knew they could take the land. God knew that the hearts of the people would not stand up when they came in. But they didn't know it because they didn't believe in God. She says to them, I know that you guys are going to take the city. Now, this is what I ask of you for saving your life. For saving your life, I ask that you would save my life and the life of my family when you come. And these guys looked at her and said, we will make a vow that we will save your life and the life of your family so long as you are all in the house and so long as you all have a scarlet cord hanging from your window. If you leave the house, we're not bound by our vow. If you don't hang the scarlet cord in the window, we're not bound by our vow. But if you'll stay in the house and hang the scarlet cord in the window, you will be saved when judgment comes on your city. And they left. And they go a few days later, the famous march around Jericho began. Six days they marched. Six days the walls stood. On the seventh day they went around the walls seven times. And the walls came tumbling down. But the spies remembered the vow. And Rahab and her entire family were saved in that moment. And they became part of Israel from that day forward. Now, Rahab didn't have a lot of things going for her. She certainly didn't have a past that would justify her salvation. She certainly didn't have a moral record to cling to that would justify her being spared when everybody else in the city was killed. I mean, if you'd gone through the city a week before it fell and said, if God saves anybody, who will he spare in this city? Your mind wouldn't have fell on Rahab and her family. She did not have a great lineage in which to put any trust in. In fact, her name is Rahab. She's named after the Egyptian god of the sun. She's in a pagan family, and if there had been a railroad track running down the middle of Jericho, she wouldn't have been born on the right side of it. She didn't have a lot going for her. She didn't know theology. She knew very little about God, only that he seemed to be a lot stronger than the God that she grew up with. But she did have some things going for her. One thing she had going for her was courage. She was bold. She was strong. Uh, when faced with the prospect of death, she stood up for what she thought was right. She should have stood up for what she thought would save her family. She had a courage about her that others did not have. And maybe that came from her line of work. Maybe that came from the way she was raised. But she was a courageous, strong, brave woman person. And there are some things in this life that you and I are not going to attain that God would want us to have because we're not brave enough, we're not courageous enough, we're not strong enough, 
to go out and get them. Like the children of Israel who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they could have had the promised land. That generation could have, but they weren't courageous enough to go get it. There are some things in this life that God would want us to have if we have the courage to take them that he has offered to us. You know, there's a reason why the most repeated command in the Bible is fear not. I think that's because God understands human nature. He knows that our tendency is to be afraid. He knows that our tendency is to retreat. I think that's something that that bullies know. Bullies know that 75% of people hate conflict, they don't like conflict, and if you put them in a place of conflict and start to turn up the heat, they'll cave to you because 75% won't stand in the face of conflict. That's true. I look at our culture today, and I think the church needs to be a little stronger and more courageous than we have been in the past, and I'm talking about the church in America. I, I, I find it interesting. And if I'll never write a book, but if I was going to write a book, it would be about this. I find it to be so ironic that in the last 30 years, everything else has gotten edgier but the church. Uh, Humor has gotten edgy. Humor has gotten insulting. It's gotten vulgar. You can't even listen to a current comedian anymore because he's not Barney Fife. It's vulgar. It's rude. It's edgy. Uh, The news is no longer delivered like Walter Cronkite. It's in your face and it's combative. When I grew up, you watch SportsCenter and you get the news. Now you turn on ESPN and it's people fighting with each other all day over sporting issues. It's argumentative. It's edgy. Music is edgy. Everything in the culture has gotten stronger and edgier except for the church. And now in the church, you can't even say the word sex without getting letters. Everything else has gotten edgy. Everything else has gotten tougher. But in the church, we're scared to death to offend anybody. In politics, everything's gotten edgy. Look at our politics. Look at how they talk to each other. Everything has gotten tough except for the church. It's gotten weak. I don't know how that happened. I don't have a clue of how the whole culture went one way and the whole church went the other way on that issue. But Rahab, Rahab was strong. She was courageous. She was brave. She faced down those secret guards. She was quick on her feet. And she looked at those guards and she said, I've risked my life to save yours. Now you're going to have to do something for me. She was courageous. Not only was she courageous, but she was a person of faith. And oftentimes those things go together. It's hard to have faith if you don't have courage. It's hard to have courage if you don't have faith. But she has faith because, again, she says, I know about your God. And what I know about your God is that he's going to be victorious. And because I know about your God, I'm going to do something for you in hopes that you who know your God will bless me through your God. Now, Faith, and you see that with her, is always belief turned into action. If you got belief, you don't have faith. Belief has to be turned into action. Because James says the devils believe. And that's not faith. Uh, The devils know more than you, and they believe more than you do. Anything that's in the Bible, the devils believe. A lot of them were there when it happened. So, Belief in and of itself is not faith. Belief has to be turned into action to be faith. Look at this seeming contradiction in the New Testament. Look at uh, Hebrews here. It says, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith The harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe, but when she had received the spies with peace. Now notice, by faith Rahab was saved. But look at what James says, James chapter 2.25. Likewise was Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. Now you have a seeming contradiction because Hebrews said she was saved by faith. James said she was justified by works. But 
is there a contradiction? No, they're both right. Uh, she believed, and so she saved the spies who were representatives of the God she believed in. If she had just believed, she wouldn't have had faith because faith is belief turned into action. And if you don't have action, you don't have biblical faith. You just have belief, and belief isn't enough to save you any more than the devils will be saved. you got to have faith. Belief turned into action, and that's what she had. Sooner or later, if you believe something really uh, deeply in your heart, it has to show up in how you act. If you believe that Jesus Christ can save you, that he's the God, that he's the son of God, that he's coming back to judge the quick and the dead, that he can lift you up, that he can make you right with the Father, sooner or later that ought to put you on your knees asking him to forgive you and save you. You can believe that, but it's got to be turned into action. He has to become the Lord of your life. If he's the Lord of heaven and he's not the Lord of your life, you just believe it, but it hasn't been turned into action. Sooner or later, you're going to have to believe that he can take care of you. You just can't say God can, God will, God is able, and keep all the money for yourself. You can't do that. If God is able to take care of you, if he knows your needs, if he knows the number of hairs on your head, if he knows what you need before he even asks, sooner or later, that's got to turn you into a generous person who supports the work of the Lord. Sooner or later... Listen, if you're, if you're not giving, either you're greedy, which is a sin, or you don't believe. But you can't say, I believe that the Lord can provide for me and then not have anything to do with the Lord in regards to your finances. Faith has to be turned into action. We have to, at some level, believe into action. I was thinking the other day, uh, I don't know why I was thinking this just things that cross your head. But I was thinking about climate change. <clears throat> Why I was thinking about climate change, there was nothing that prompted me to think about climate change. Uh, maybe, I, I don't know why, but uh, something I, I ate, something I ate. And, uh, but I, I was just sitting there thinking about why am I not worried about climate change? Maybe I should be worried about climate change, but why am I currently not worried about climate change. And I just started to think, well, there's, there's, there's four reasons why I'm not worried about climate change. Three are okay, but it's really the fourth one is the reason I'm not worried about climate change. The, the three that are, are there but that don't seal the deal is that uh, the people who seem to be worried about climate change don't seem to be doing anything about climate change. They fly in those private jets and, and get into a series of SUVs to go give a speech about climate change, and then they go back to a 30,000 square foot energy-eating mansion. And if they're so scared about climate change, why aren't they doing something about climate change? Well, that's one of the reasons I don't worry about climate change. The, the other reason is because the scientists who talk about climate change so much, when I was growing up, were talking about the next ice age, and now they're talking about now the heat. And they're all over the map. So I don't know what to do with the science. Thirdly, even if it's true, I can't do anything about it. I, mean, I, I drive an 07 Corolla. I don't drive an SUV. And I don't own cows. And I eat all of them that I can. I've done all I can do. Nothing else I can do about bovine flatulence. Done what I can do. <clears throat> um, but, but, but you take all of that, and really, the reason I, I, I have trouble with climate change is that when I read the Bible, I don't believe the world is coming to an end because of overheating. I believe that the world is coming to an end when Jesus Christ returns. And so that's my theology, that God is not going to let the world end by any other means than his son returning to judge the quick and the dead. So I'm just going to sleep on that. Whatever they say, they can say we got 100 years left if we don't fix something. They can say we got 50 years left if we don't get emissions under control. I just believe that the world will end when Jesus Christ comes back again. 
And if he wants to come back sooner, if God looks down and says, ooh, global warming's going to take us out in 50 years, I better hurry up and come in 20, that's just fine with me. I don't know how he's going to do that, but that's fine. Now, if you're 18 and you don't want the Lord to come because you've got a lot of stuff to do, then, you know, don't raise cows and eat all the ones that you can and drive a bicycle. But I just believe that he's coming back and I'm going to sleep okay with that. I just have to believe that. And if I believe it, then I shouldn't worry about it. See, sooner or later, what you believe just has to be turned into action. I was reading in Hebrews chapter 11, and it's interesting that it says that Jacob, when it came time for him to die, blessed all his sons and worshiped the Lord. And then his son, Joseph, when it came time for Joseph to die, it says that Joseph made sure he reminded everybody that when they left Egypt, not to forget about his bones. It's just interesting. Here are two guys on the point of death. They don't seem too worried about it. There's Jacob saying, remember what I told you to do after I'm gone? And let's have a prayer meeting. And there's Joseph saying, it's about time for me to move on. I just want to remind you, don't leave my bones over there. Take them back to where my father's at when you guys head on back. Don't forget about me. Think about the faith that they had at the point of what many would consider tragedy. They believed in God. They took him at his word. And when they believed in him, it moved them to faith so that as they're facing the final breaths of their life, they had action or confidence or praise for God even in the midst of that issue. Uh, one of the uh, worries, and I've been forthright with this uh, with many of you, uh, Probably if, if you were to ask me what my biggest worry is, is that I won't be able to keep my stuff together when everybody in my family starts dying. <coughs> uh, I, I don't know how I'll respond to that. But, you know, I was reading in First Kings or Second Kings the other day, and something just struck me that had never struck me before. Elijah has died, and, or he hadn't died, he's gone up in the chariot. Jerry comes down, Elijah gets in it, he goes up in fire, and, and he's gone, and everybody is welling, everybody's saying, where did Elijah go? Will Elijah be back? Because this is very traumatic. Elijah was the spiritual leader of his time. I, I mean, people hung their hopes on him. He stood for what was right in the nation, and it seemed at times he was the only one standing for what's right. It's very traumatic that Elijah has gone, and again, people are grieving, and they're very concerned and hoping that he'll come back. But Elisha says something to the effect of, my father, which he referred to as Elijah because he had served him for 20 years, he had been a spiritual father to Elisha, and, and, and he says, he's gone, and I miss him more than all of you. He's gone, and there's nobody here who will, who will miss his presence more than me. But in verse 14 of 2 Kings chapter 2, he says, but this is what I want to know. Where is the Lord of Elijah? He said, because essentially, if the Lord of Elijah is still here, even though Elisha might have gone, if the Lord of Elijah is still here, we're still going to be okay. Because it wasn't Elijah that did the works. It was the Lord of Elijah uh, that did the works through Elijah. And if he's here, if he's with us, we're all going to be okay. And see, even at the point of saying goodbye people that we love. And again, I don't know how, how I'm going to be through all of this. I'm scared to death. But what I do believe is that if I believe that God remains, if I believe that God is able, if I believe that he's a present help in time of need, that's going to have to be turned to faith where I say, listen, he's gone on, she's gone on, but the God they served is remaining with me. And if he remains with me, somehow, some way, by his grace, I'm going to walk through this. Sooner or later, you're going to have to have faith. And Rahab had faith. She believed that the God 
that the spy served was more powerful than her gods. And she said, I believe it so much and I'm going to spare your life and I'm going to ask you to do something. When you come back, I'm trusting you guys. You guys know that God. When that God comes to destroy the city, you save my life. And they said, we will if you've got something. If you've got a third thing. You've got courage, Rahab. You've got faith, Rahab. But you're going to have to hang the scarlet cord out the window. Scarlet cord isn't hanging. You're not going to be saved when judgment comes on this city. Now again, this is typology. This is a picture of something. And what it is a picture of is immediately something that had preceded it. Forty years before when Egypt was, or when the Israelites were leaving Egypt, the final night they were there, there was a Passover. And God said through Moses that each person was to kill a lamb and they were to paint on the door uh, post. They were to put blood on the doorpost, and when the angel of death passed over, hence Passover, that he would pass over and spare any family that had the blood on the doorpost. Now, these spies knew about that. That was very much a part of, of their legacy because this had happened 40 years before. This is how they had been spared. And so here are these spies, and they say, essentially, uh, don't go kill a lamb and put blood all over your house, that's going to be conspicuous. But, put the scarlet cord, you hang it out the window, and what the Passover was for us 40 years ago, the blood on the doorpost, that scarlet cord will be for you when the armies come into this city in a few days. Now we know the Passover points to Christ. If the Passover points to Christ, the scarlet cord which points to the Passover points to Christ. What we know in the Bible is that when Jesus Christ came, John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God. And Jesus became the perfect image of what the Passover and what the scarlet cord represented, which is this, that when you and I come to Christ, when you and I accept his sacrifice on the cross, whenever we look at the blood that was shed for sin and we say, may that blood be for me, may my sins be covered by that blood, I'm turning from my sins and I'm turning to you as Savior and may the blood you shed on Calvary cover my sins when your Father looks down. When we do that, we have blood on our doorpost. We have a scarlet cord hanging out our window, so to speak. So when God looks down on us, he sees not our sins, but he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you can have courage and you can have faith, but if you don't have the blood, that's not enough to get you through the coming judgment. All the courage... And all the faith in the world won't save you if you reject Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is who God has designated as his Savior. And, and, and it is coming to Jesus and being covered by his sacrifice it, that will get us through the judgment that will come at the end of time or before that. Because the angel of death may pass over you before Jesus Christ comes again. The angel of death passes over everybody. The rate of death is one per one person. The Passover is coming to you. And you need to have the blood of Jesus Christ on your doorpost. You need to have the scarlet cord hanging out your window. Here's this woman, Rahab. She did not have a great record to run on. She did not have what we might consider a record of righteousness. But she had courage. She had faith. And she had a scarlet cord. And she was saved. Her family was not maybe the kind of family that you would expect God to be merciful to when he seemed to be unmerciful to others. But because of the courage, because of the faith, because of the scarlet cord of Rahab, they were saved when judgment came on their city. And some of you are here today maybe, and because of the way you've lived, because of your past, because of the things that have happened in your life, particularly when you were raising your children, you look at your life and you say, because of my influence on them, I don't think they'll ever be saved. Don't say that. 
Rahab could have said that. She could have said, my family is so far from God, they will never be right. Don't limit God in your life. Don't put a hedge around God. God is able. He stands on the porch. He's looking for your lost loved ones. He can do for them what he's done for you. He can send his spirit to speak to them. Don't give up on those lost loved ones. What Rahab said at the very beginning, she said, I don't want money. I don't want to claim. The only thing that I want is for my family to be saved. When you get to the point where you say it's not about prestige, it's not about finances, what I want more than anything else in this world is for my family to be saved. If you'll say that to the Lord, he will begin to work in your life. Your family's not too far from being saved because they're not too far from God. He can chase them down. He can run them down. As the song said, he can chase a prodigal to the gates of hell. But notice something else. You would think that when Rahab was saved, nation falls, children of Israel take over, there's Rahab and her family. You would think that Rahab, although saved, would be a second class citizen among the people of God. I mean, she's saved because she helped spies, but she's a prostitute. I mean, it's nice for her to show up at worship, but don't let her testify. She might name names. <clears throat> um, I mean, she helped us. She helped us. But she sort of needs to stay over there around the people who are less holy. Well, what's interesting is this. Matthew chapter 1, verse 6, we're told that when Rahab came to Israel, she married a guy named Salmon. Like Patty, Salmon Patty. And it said that Salmon and Rahab had a son, and his name was Boaz. And Boaz, we know, married a woman named Ruth. And so Ruth's mother-in-law was Rahab. And you can understand then maybe how, I wonder if Rahab even put Ruth up to just go in there and lay next to his feet. You'll be okay. He'll marry you if you know that story. I don't know. But there was no greater honor that could be bestowed on an Old Testament person than to be in the direct lineage of the Messiah and Redeemer. No greater honor could be bestowed on anyone than to be a great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. And so Rahab, she not only was saved, but she was brought into the covenant people of God, and she was given the highest honor of her generation in Israel to be part of the seed that would bring about the Messiah. All I'm trying to say to you is this. If God will save you, he'll bless you. If he'll redeem you, he'll exalt you. If he'll embrace you, he'll elevate you. There are no second-class people with God. Who he saves, he loves. Who he saves, he'll redeem. He'll give an inheritance in heaven. He'll make a joint heir with his son, Jesus Christ. He'll take a Saul and he'll make him a Paul. He'll take a Peter and he'll make him the rock of the church. He'll take Rahab and he'll make her the, make her the great, great grandmother of his son, Jesus Christ. There's no leverage with God. There's no levels with God. Who he saves, he loves, he blesses. And maybe today, you can stand with me. Maybe today you need to put some faith in the God who not only saves but blesses. Maybe you haven't put the faith in him that you need to. Now's a good time to start. There's never a bad time to start trusting Jesus Christ. Maybe you have some family that you're saying, Lord, I don't want to just make it to heaven, but Lord, will you save my family? Never a bad time to start praying about that. Never a bad time to kneel at an altar of prayer and say, Lord, I've been chasing a lot of stuff in life, 
but the one thing that I want more than anything else is for my family to be saved in the day of judgment. The thing I want more than anything else in the world is for all of us to stand around the throne of your son, Jesus Christ, and give glory forever. Maybe you need to pray that prayer today. Maybe you have belief, but you don't have action. If you have belief, but not action, you don't have faith. But God can help us in our unbelief. He can help our lack of faith. He can strengthen us, and he can make us all that we ought to be for him. Maybe today you don't have a scarlet cord hanging out your window. You've never really come to Jesus Christ and asked for forgiveness of sins. You never have made it right with the Lord. When you lay down tonight and go to sleep, you're not sure where you would be if you died in your sleep tonight. You don't need to live that way. I lived that way for many years. It's a miserable way to live. Jesus Christ is here today, and he can bless you. The blood he shed for me was blood he shed for you too. And you can be forgiven today, and you can sleep well tonight because he's here and he loves you. He sent his son to die for you. Do some business with the Lord today. If he embrace Rahab, he'll embrace you. You're not too far. You're not too far. He's here for you. And who he saves, he'll bless. Let me pray with you today. Lord, we thank you for this day and for this place. And there are some people here that you've been talking to this week. You've been prompting them. And it's not an accident that they're here today. You have brought them here so that they will make a decision that may change the complete trajectory of their life. Father, I pray that you'll give them courage. Oh, Lord, don't, don't let them retreat. Don't let them back up from you. Don't, don't let Satan whisper into their ears in this moment. You can think about this later. You don't, you don't want to go forward. You don't want to make a scene. You don't want to make a fool out of yourself. Like Naaman, Lord, I pray that they'll come into the Jordan River and find healing for their souls, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen. This wasn't exactly what we planned on doing today. The scarlet means, according to Siri, <laughs> a brilliant red color. And the Word of God, in a red-letter edition, the red represents the words of Jesus Christ. I pray you'd be obedient today. I pray you'd listen to these words and put action to your faith this morning. Yeah. 